Hi, my name is Maria Schreiber, and today I will be speaking to you about using the R programming language to do exploratory data analysis. The basic outline of my presentation is talking about the steps of big data analysis and where exploratory data analysis fits into that, why R is a good choice for that, and then the majority of this will actually be a basic R live code. So big data is analyzed very similarly to how other data sets are analyzed. We just have some different tools and foci when we go through this process. So we begin by asking questions or formulating hypotheses, just like we would any other time that we're analyzing data. We have to collect data, uh, or perhaps identify it, because there's so much data that's already out there, we just need to take it. You know, data is being generated at crazy amounts every single second right now, and sometimes we just need to scrape it off of a website rather than actually forming an experiment. Um, this is, this next step is now a much larger part, or probably it wasn't existent before, data wrangling or munging, which is just cleaning the data and making it into a format so that it can be analyzed. Since we're taking data from so many different sources, um, it can be really messy and it needs to be fit into kind of a box that um, we can then run analyses on it. So the next step is exploratory data analysis, and that's just looking at the data and trying to find any patterns or trends that we might not have expected to be there. And this is not really a linear process. It's not like we go step one, two, three, four, five, six. It's iterative. You might go back and go forward again. So often after exploratory data analysis, you'll step back to the beginning because you might have new questions or have reformulated your hypotheses. So once you have a question set or some questions set, then you do the formal modeling. And this is where uh, the buzz terms like machine learning and neural networks come in, in this formal predictive part. And then finally, we have to draw conclusions and communicate those conclusions frequently using visualizations. So I'm going to focus in on the exploratory part. And I found that that's a really exciting and fun part because you're just trying to see what's out there. There's, there's nothing specific you're looking for. You don't have to create any polished products. You're just curious about what the data says. So this is a quote from an author I really like named Kathy O'Neill, who actually wrote a textbook on data science. But uh, she, she was an academic, and then she was a Wall Street quant. And now she um, has more of a political activism take to her blogging. She has a really awesome blog you can check out called Math Babe. Um, so anyway, she says, EDA happens between you and the data and isn't about proving anything to anyone else yet. So it's really just you checking out what is there. So here is where R comes in. R is an open source statistical programming language that has been around since the mid-90s, but is actually becoming more and more popular. Some of you may have been exposed to R in college science classes or in math classes, but as data are pervading all aspects of our lives, uh, more and more people, not just academics, are using this language. It's an interpreted language, so it can be used in the command line, but there are free and beautiful and wonderful graphic user interfaces, and we'll be using RStudio in just a second. And then the last point I'd like to make about this is just like we've seen with Node, there is a really vibrant community that contributes free packages that let you do basically anything you want with R. Well, not anything, but a lot of things. So being new to New York City, I um, was curious about some data and from uh, NYC Open Data, I picked a couple of data sets to look at. So let's look at some code. So this is what our studio looks like. And in the top left corner, that's the main portion of it. I've opened up something called a notebook file. Uh, and in the white, you can write anything you'd like in Markdown. And then in the gray, you can write code. And it doesn't have to be R, but obviously that's what we're focusing on now. So in the bottom, this is the console. It's just like the command line. and. You can, there's familiar commands that might have a slightly different name, like this is print working directory, right? Um, and I want to make sure I'm in the right directory that has all of my data sets. So here we are. Um, the first thing you need to do is just load the libraries you'll be using. And here I am 
loading a data set about housing complaints in New York City. So I've just named this variable complaints, and generally you use a left-facing arrow to assign a variable, but we could do an equals, and that should be fine too. And I will start loading it, because it's quite a large data set, almost a million housing complaints in New York City. <laughs> And uh, this STR command stands for structure, and it's just going to give me a list of the different columns and the, the data types of those columns. So it's still loading. Um, I'm going to explain also, I'm going to run the summary command in a second, and that's just going to give me a brief summary of the data. So you can see here 993,137 observations or rows in 15 different variables or columns. So we have complaint ID, and that's an integer, et cetera, et cetera. Some things are factors, and that's kind of like SQLize enum, so it has to be one of these, you know, it needs to be Bronx, Brooklyn, can't be anything else. Sometimes R has chosen to make things factors that shouldn't be factors, like the housing number, it doesn't really make sense for it to be a factor with 14,870 choices, um, or for the dates to be factored, um, which is, we'll actually change that in a second. So we can run our summary, and this is already a little bit more helpful than, say, like if we were to look at the complaints data set, which we can open, and the way that our visual cortex has evolved, like this doesn't really mean anything to us, right? It's just like a lot of black and white, and it doesn't make sense. But even with this summary right here, it makes a little bit more sense. So for the numerical data, it gives us the minimum, first quartile median, mean, third quartile max. Um, and for categorical data, it gives us like the number, so it makes sense that the largest number of complaints are in Brooklyn. Um, but <laughs> that's not as useful as making an actual visualization of that. So this is um, some ggplot code. The first argument is just the data frame that I named complaints. And the aesthetic wrapper, I'm choosing x to be my burrow. And then fill is just how I want to color it in. So there was another variable up here called status that was either open or closed. And you can see that, as we expected, Brooklyn has the highest, followed by Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and most of these complaints are closed. Uh, so R can also be used to transform data. So what I did here was I just took the column. If you want to access a particular column within a data frame, you just reference it by putting uh, a dollar sign. And I recast them as dates. And then I created a brand new column called days to resolve, which just subtracted the received date from the status date to see how long that took. So you can see here in my environment, I had 15 variables or columns, and now I have 16 because there's a brand new column there called days to resolve. So if I graph that, still with my burrow on the x and my days to resolve on the y, we can kind of see how long it took by burrow for things to get resolved. And I'm choosing to make a jitter plot rather than a scatter plot. A jitter plot is very similar to a scatter plot, except that instead of having the point exactly where it should be, it moves it around a little bit randomly. And that makes sense because if we just had them all on top of each other, it wouldn't really tell us a lot. Like without this being a jitter plot, this would just be five straight lines. But instead, we get kind of an idea of the density. And that's why I made the size smaller and alpha is just a way to fiddle with the transparency. So again, wherever there's darker clusters, that's where most of the data is. So as we can see, most of these complaints got resolved in less, five, less than 500 days. Um, there's this weird blip in Queens that for some reason it took 10 years to complain, <laughs> to, uh, to resolve these complaints, which, you know, maybe we wouldn't have known if we didn't do this exploration. So um, there's, there's quite a lot more here. Um, there's some other graphs that I created uh, looking at two data sets that I combined about electric and, and water um, use in New York City, and you can see some of the coolest things that you can do without me talking about it too much, um, with really very minimal code it added to it. So I just wanted to show you some of the resources that I used, because this is a very easy language to learn, at least at a basic level. So our bloggers and our cookbook um, are very pretty, uh, and they also show you what to do. The ggplot2 docs are really fantastic. And I also wanted to mention that I'm going to post the HTML file that um, is going to be the result of the live code on 
my medium. So if you are interested in using R, and I, I hope um, I've convinced you that it's actually like very simple to use, and if you're interested in looking at a lot of the data that is out there, um, you can download RStudio for free, and you can start visualizing data today. Thank you.